The Gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, from the lectionary reading appointed for today. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And um, we're reading from the contemporary English Bible. We will ask you to stand as you are able. Do you normally put the words up on the screen? Um, Ryan, take them down. Good. There's a reason I'm doing that, right? The gospel is meant to be heard, right? Especially Mark. Mark comes to us as an oral tradition first, and then it was written down. It's a story to be heard. And the problem I have, and this is just me, you'll get to know me better as the days go by. I'm a little crazy. The problem, at least this is, I'm just speaking for myself, I'm sure none of you do this, is that when someone is reading scripture and you're reading there, you're not hearing the scripture, you're checking to make sure they didn't make a mistake. <laughs> Right? Am I right? Am I wrong? Okay. Told you I was a little nuts. <laughs> Hear these words from Scripture from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him because that's what disciples do. Oh, now you're messing with me because they have it on the screen down here for me to read, not for you to see. <laughs> Let's see, Mark comes after Jeremiah, <laughs> somewhere after uh, Jonah and the fish. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? Where, what's the wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Hey, isn't this just the carpenter? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Did you know Jesus had brothers? Aren't his sisters with him? There, they were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, prophets are honored everywhere except in their hometowns, among their relatives and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there except he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages, teaching he called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick, no bread, mm -mm, no bags, no, no money in their belts, no American Express, no MasterCard, no Visa. He told them to wear sandals. Hello. <laughs> he told them to wear sandals but not to put on two shirts. Oops. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as witness against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons, and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. This ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Would you please be seated? Well, before I start with the actual content of the sermon, I want to say thank you. First of all, to all of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary, those of you joining us online, wherever you happen to be, I am so glad you took the time and the energy to be here this morning on my first Sunday with Community United Methodist Church. 
I cannot, I cannot thank you enough. I also want to say what a great sports you are for wearing Hawaiian crazy shirts. And even if you didn't, for wearing red, white, and blue on the Independence Day, that is totally awesome. And for willing to uh, put on these crazy lays. I, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that's all about here in a minute. But I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. And one thing I, I noticed, two things I noticed this morning before I get started. First of all, you are an unusual group of United Methodists. <laughs> especially this side. <laughs> Do you notice how close they're sitting to the front? <laughs> right? Donna, you're the closest while I... Right? But you can sit in the front row if you want. <laughs> Rats. I thought I might at least get a hug out of that. <laughs> That's OK. And um, second of all, uh, in my previous ministry as director, as a managing editor of communications for the Baltimore Washington Conference, I had an opportunity to do a lot of guest preaching around the conference. So I have been in many, many, many different sanctuaries over the last eight years. One of the things that's consistent about all those sanctuaries is they have a clock right where the pastor can see it. <laughs> and where only the pastor can see it. <laughs> but thank you, not only for welcoming me as kindly and warmly as you have, but I know there is a lot of transition going on in this congregation right now. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge that. I acknowledge there is grief and there is pain about moving to a 9 o'clock worship start. This is the first Sunday for that, right? And I understand that. So thank you for being who you are as people and children of God to see your way to move yourself here at 9 o'clock. Right? It's really early for me, I'll be totally honest. <laughs> you know, but here we are, so thank you. And again, um, I just wanted to say one special word of thanks as I'm thanking everybody. Barb, Julian, would you please stand up for a second? Would you give her a round of applause, please? You have no idea how much work Barb has done in the last two, three months, especially in the last month, and for making the transition go as seamlessly and as smoothly as it has. I cannot thank you enough. So I, I mean that from my heart. Thank you so much. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Almighty and most gracious God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable this day in your sight, for you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> You've heard that saying, you can always go home again, or you can never go home again. It works both ways, right? I know it's a new roof, but <laughs> <clears throat> they say that home is the place where they always have to take you in, right? No matter what you've done or not done, home is the place where they always have to take you in. At least that's how it's supposed to work. I know it doesn't work like that all the time, but that's what they say. So let me ask you a quick question. When was the last time you were home? Anybody want to share? One of the things you'll learn about me is that when I ask questions in the congregation, answering out loud is encouraged. <laughs> <clears throat> right? I want to hear from you. I'm, I mean that seriously. When was the last time you went home and where is home? Donna, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Lynchburg, South Carolina. Three years ago.
Mm -hmm. Awesome. It was touching to go back home again. Yeah. Anybody else willing to share? I know the people online might not have a <clears throat> good time to hear that. I'm trying to repeat it back so the people worshiping with us online can also get a taste of what people are saying. Any Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, Kentucky. Yes. When, this last Christmas. Awesome. Anybody else? The last time I was home was in May of this year. My home is in Midland, Michigan, home of the Dow Chemical Company. Yeah, my dad worked for Dow. My brother worked for Dow. My sister works for Dow. Guess what I was going to do when I graduated college? <laughs> God had other plans. I don't work for Dow. But it was wonderful to go back home and to see my mother and give her a hug. My mom will be nine. There's something about standing right here, is it? Oh, I gotta move, oh, I've got too big of a beard. They're giving me the cues back and the, I am not shaving. Um, <laughs> my mother will be 90 on Christmas Eve. She is a church organist and has played church music and in church since she was a 14-year-old girl living in Wales. That's where she was born and raised. But what if you can't go home again? What if you just can't for whatever reason? Jesus tried it, as we heard about in our scripture lesson this morning. Jesus tried to go home again. And how well did that go? Did you notice? Jesus was kind of rejected by his own home people because, do you notice the question? Isn't this the... Carpenter, Carpenter's son. Isn't this Mary's boy, right? I mean, when I go home, I'm Meyer's son. My mom's name is Meyer, right? I am not Reverend Eric Allsgard. I'm Eric, Meyer's kid. Jesus had the same thing happen to him. He could do no miracles there. Did you notice this in Mark? He could do no miracles there except he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief, by the way. Now, I could sound, uh, I could preach a whole sermon just on that chunk of text right there. And I have and probably will sometime later. But anyway, the power of people's disbelief prevented miracles from happening. There's, like I said, that's a whole sermon right there. But it says he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That sounds like a miracle to me. I don't know about you. So, you know, what is Scripture really trying to tell me here? I don't want to quibble. I don't want to quibble with Scripture. Actually, I quibble with Scripture a lot. Mark, do you quibble with Scripture a lot? Do you argue, ask questions of Scripture a lot? Sure. Sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Oops. What do you do when you get rejected by your own home? You make a new one. You make a new one, right? Today is my first Sunday here at Community United Methodist Church. I am honored, deeply honored to be your pastor. I am proud, deeply proud to be your pastor. If you hear nothing else from today, if you remember nothing else from today, hear those two things. I am deeply honored and deeply proud to be your pastor. I'm starting a new home today. Not because I was kicked out or rejected by the one previously, don't get me wrong, right? But when you are an elder, an ordained elder like me in the United Methodist Church, you serve as under appointment by a bishop. My membership, my local church membership is not here. Did you know that? United Methodist clergy are never members of the church to which they are appointed, never. My membership is at the annual conference. So my church meets at annual conference, which happens once a year, sometimes for two or three days. So I get to go to church two or three days a year. 
That's why I never miss annual conference, ever, because that's my peeps, right? That's where I get to go and be with my people. Just like you come here every Sunday, please, I pray, right? And be with your people and be with God. What it means to be an elder is that you go where the bishop says go. And the bishop said to me back in April, go, go. And this is where she sent me. This is where God sent me. I believe. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a lot of work to do. Don't get me wrong. It's not going to be easy. Nobody said it would be easy, but it's going to be fun all the way. All right? You have my word on that. Cheryl Cook, you going to back me up on that? Cheryl and I worked together at the Baltimore Washington Conference. Her office was literally just down the hall from mine, right? And when uh, back in the, no, we haven't seen each other in the office for 18 months, but one of my favorite things to do to Cheryl when, uh, when I would walk by her office is I would just simply reach across the door and turn her lights off. <laughs> do you remember that? I stopped doing that because I thought I was getting annoying. <laughs> so together, you and I are going to build a new home. Today, starting today, we're going to start building a new home. Not that the old one is or was bad. Don't misunderstand me, right? That's not what I'm saying. Because I'm not talking about the physical building. I'm talking about ministry homes. Reaching out to the community, building in ministry, being in ministry around the world. I really love the, the dish and the little carved, it uh, looks like a letter opener from Zimbabwe. I've had the privilege of going to Zimbabwe once. Uh, the Baltimore Washington Conference does a pastor's school with all the pastors in Zimbabwe every other year. Uh, I had the honor and privilege of going one time and uh, meeting those unbelievable servants of God. It was just, it changed my life. It also changed my life to go to Victoria Falls. If you've ever had the, if you ever have the opportunity to go, um, you need to do it. It's just in, unbelievable. Now we're going to be building a new home in a time of great transition. Praise the Lord. The pandemic seems to be on its way out. Although I am very worried about the Delta variant, right? I really am. The pandemic, for all its grief and troubles and issues, it's giving us a chance to start something new, together, to build a new home. And that's why I asked you to wear Hawaiian shirts and why we got Lay's. Because I've never been to Hawaii, but I did work at Walt Disney World. Anybody here been to Walt Disney World? Anybody here rode, rode on the monorail? I drove the monorail. I remember you. I did too. You're the one who pushed the door open and caused me to have to stop, and I had to do a door alert for three miles. <laughs> I love you already. <coughs> they have a resort there called the Polynesian Resort which is Hawaiian Polynesian themed, right? All the, when you walk in, they say aloha. Instead of saying thank you, they say mahalo, right? So I thought when you get welcome to your new home, you need a Hawaiian shirt and, and you need a lei. So that's why I got these. Actually, these were Cheryl Cook's idea. <laughs> right? They were. I love it. We're going to get along well, this little microphone and I, aren't we? <laughs> so we're going to start building a new, ho new home by building relationships. That's what I see in the future for the short term, long term. Again, not that the relationships aren't already there. I'm talking about ministry relationships, my relationships to you, you to me, you to each other. 
We're going to strengthen and examine them to see if they're healthy. We're going to start a lot of new relationships this morning. (laughs) You and me, me and you, Community United Methodist Church with Wilson United Methodist Church, and Wilson United Methodist Church with Community United Methodist Church. I think we have some representatives from Wilson here this morning, do we not? Welcome. Give them a round of applause. And with your permission, I have a box of Lay's that I will be happy to hand out to all your folks as they come in. All right? My wife, Sheila. Have you met Sheila? Sorry, this is my... Stand up, stand up. This is my lovely wife, Sheila George, and uh, she is the Director of Marketing and Communications at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Jesus was more, to my way of thinking, Jesus was more about relationships than he was about anything else. Well, yeah, I mean, he talked a lot about the kingdom of God and God's love and all that, but he was always building and making relationships, right? And he got in trouble for it, did he not? He was eating with sinners. He talked to the woman at the well. (laughs) What are you doing? He got into trouble for all that. But I think Jesus was more about relationships than he was about following the rules, the law of the church, of the Jewish scribes, Pharisees, what have you, of that day. I often get in trouble for breaking the rules. I'm warning, I'm warning, Barb has already discovered this. (laughs) But I'm more interested in people than I am in pretty much anything else, right? Because it's the relationships that matter. How is it with your soul? How is it with your walk with Christ these days? Tell me about that. Where do you feel God calling you to go next? Those kind of questions. That's what I really want to get at the heart of. So I hope you will join me in getting in some good trouble. If you know who said that. Do I get an amen? Amen. Join me in getting in some good trouble as we build these relationships together, right? I'm going to end my sermon this morning by quoting from one of my favorite spiritual mentors. He is Father Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, Rohr. Um, He is a Franciscan who publishes a daily devotional. I see Paul nodding your head. Yeah, others, right? I love him. Sorry? Sorry? I do too, I do too. Um, The other day, I don't know if you saw Paul, but he had uh, a a one that just, I said, I'm stealing this lock, stock, and barrel for the end of my sermon. Um, And I am quoting him, and I'm giving him the credit. This is not my words, these are Richard Rohr's. But um, he publishes this daily devotional that speaks to me so often, it's like he's reading my mind. And there's not a whole lot there to read, by the way, but you get the picture. He was um, reflecting how his spiritual journey began in 1973, and he said the following when he started his journey. These words spoke to me, and I hope they speak to you and us today. Again, I'm quoting Richard Rohr. We begin a great adventure We begin something new. The promise is upon us. God will give us something new. Did you hear the words to the hymn earlier? This is a day of new beginning. God will give us something new. All we have to come with is hunger. Let me say that again. All you have to come with is hunger. We have to come 
we must come expecting and wanting something more than we already have now. We get what we expect from God. When we have new ears to hear with, God can speak a new word to us. When we no longer expect anything new or anything more from God, for all practical purposes, we do not really believe in God. Uh God now wants to speak something new to us when we have the understanding of a great themes of scripture and the whole book, from Genesis to Revelation, we see it as communicating a divine pattern to humanity. One basic message is finally communicated to all spirit-filled people who enter the faith dialogue with scripture. The message of the good news is this. You ready? You are loved. You are are unique. You are free. Celebrating freedom today, right? You are free in Jesus' name. You are on the way. You are going somewhere. Your life has meaning. That is all, and he finishes by saying, that is all grounded in the experience and the knowledge and the reality of the unconditional love of God. I don't know a better way to put it but than to say, you are loved. You are unique. You are free. You are on the way. You are going somewhere. We are going somewhere. I hope you'll join me on the journey. Amen. Will you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Almighty and most gracious God, we do give you thanks and praise for this day. For again gathering here in your house where we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, for those worshiping with us online, Our spirits are together now in one as we bow our heads together for prayer. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful warm welcome I have felt here this morning, for the way your spirit has permeated our time together, for the music, for the praise band, and for the choir, for all the many ways that have bound us yet together in new ways today. God, we're going to need to rely on you so, so much in the coming weeks and months. There is so much transition. There is so much change. There is so much work to do. But Lord, we are confident that apart from you, nothing is impossible. And so we're going to lean heavy on you, Lord. We're going to lean real heavy on you. Uh, But we know that you can take it. Not only that, but you expect it. you You love us for it. And so, God, on this my first Sunday here at Community United Methodist Church, I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And I say thank you to the people gathered here and with us online. Thank you. And proclaim that God loves you and so do I and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.